Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. And we're still in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 42. Good morning, Allison and Cynthia and Darcy. Darcy. Hi, Darcy. God bless you. <laughs> Uh, it's a wonderful day in the Ozarks. It's Beautiful. nice and crisp. It's been very warm in early spring, and they're saying it's going to be a wintry mix this weekend. Yeah, and we're flying to D.C. tomorrow morning. We so are flying out. Y'all be praying. <laughs> we're going to be up at 3 in the morning. And Tell therefore, them where we're going to be. Well, we're going to Sterling, Virginia. We're going to be with Apostle Ricardo Watson and Carrie Lee and Carrie Lee at Revival Embassy this weekend, and then we're going to Albany, New York, Albany slash Amsterdam mm -hmm. nearby, and we'll be ministering in at least two locations there, and probably more. And just excited about Amen. returning to the East Coast. We have a date coming up in Atlanta. We have another date coming up in Baltimore. Yep. And Canada's on the calendar. Canada is on the calendar for Florida. later on in the year. And something's cooking in Arizona. Something's <laughs> cooking in Arizona. And we want to get back to Dallas and to Houston. Yes, we do. Uh, we've had it in our hearts to make that trip. Uh, Oklahoma City, Dallas, Houston. We're going to get that done. Mm -hmm. We've got, we got peeps in that part of <laughs> The world, and so we just want to have it all. When, it. when we read Matthew six thirty three, mm -hmm. it says, "Seek first the kingdom; all these things will be added." Uh, all means all. That three letter word is all encompassing, and not to mention Nashville. And I was thinking about <laughs> Nashville and Carla McCombs and Allison and Jeff yes, yes. and uh, many of our other friends, um, Cindy, Cindy Loftus, Loftus and her yeah. husband. Yes, Jesse. Was, Jesse was such a <laughs> Powerful, uh, Allison will remember in the, the packed meeting that we had, and as the Spirit of God came, Jesse was up there, my God, my God. <laughs> it was when uh, Allison's <laughs> friend was singing One Moment in Time. Oh, my gosh. I still get goosebumps, Allison, when I remember that moment. It was powerful. Hello, Nanette. <laughs> and, and Allison, Location. if I remember correctly, there was a pastor who who sat near you? I think it's somebody that you and Jeff know. I could be I could be wrong, but if you maybe it isn't you. But he he talked to me and he taught he sent me an email about coming to minister and God's opening doors and sending us into churches more and more. And I would really mm -hmm. be interested in his name and his email address again. Mm -hmm. If it's not you, Allison, of course, never mind. But if you were in the Nashville meeting, and that's you contact me because we do have it in our hearts Praise we God. wanted to come to nashville for the eclipse yeah in that's august. coming up in <laughs> august but i don't think that's going to happen right so. no the schedule got too full for that <laughs> so we're just excited we get to have it all all means all yeah it's all <laughs> of it whatever god has we want our part <laughs> today isaiah 42 the compulsory rule of christ in this chapter, Isaiah speaks of the Messiah who comes first as a suffering Savior. And then returning as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Because the Jews could only see the ruling king, they rejected Jesus. Because he came as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And if you read... If you go to Kabad.org, C-H-A-B-A-D, Kabad.org, it's a Jewish resource site. And uh, if you can get Jewish people to, to, to speak candidly about Jesus, that's one of the things that they still have issues with Jesus because they, they don't see a suffering Messiah. They see a reigning Messiah. When you show them the scriptures that speak of Jesus' suffering, they will say, well, that's the suffering of the Jewish people suffering for the sins of the world. Mm. And that's the way they believe that, many of them. And that's just a whole other conversation where we would see it 
differently. But to this day, that veil of unbelief, mm -hmm. which, you know where that came from? Paul said it was the veil that Moses wore so the people would not see the glory fading from his face because Moses would come out of the presence of God and his face would be shining with the glory. And then he would put a veil over his face so the people could not see when the glory lifted. You know, the way most people read that, they say, well, Moses was protecting the people. No, Moses was protecting himself because the people were more manageable when the glory was shining in his face. Mm -hmm. People dropped dead when they crossed Moses while the glory was shining on his face. So he put the veil on there to keep the people in check, to keep them manageable. And that character flaw came up later on when Moses struck the rock when he should have spoken to it, his attitude toward the people that cost him his entrance into the promised land. But that's the same veil. They don't see, the Jewish people are not willing to accept vulnerability in their leaders. They're not willing to accept a suffering savior. They just want to see, like John the Baptist, a champion that's going to come. He's going to purge his, thoroughly purge his floor. He's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And that was John's problem when he said to Jesus, you know, uh, Jesus came kissing babies and drinking wine and hanging out with publicans and sinners. <laughs> and John said, hey, are you he that should come or do we look for another? And he had to lose his head. Literally to get out of the way of something God was doing. <clears throat> and so uh, we see much of this in the writings of Isaiah as he, he speaks. He goes on to describe in our chapter today, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow among the nations. This is not just something that happens in eternity. Isaiah taught that this is something that will happen in the earth, in the narrative of human history that there will come a day that Jesus will return to establish a thousand-year compulsory rule over the nations. You know, you know what compulsory is, don't you, Mom? <laughs> That's when your kids are trying to get over on you, and you, you override them. You say, look at me. Look at me. Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? You are not going to go spend the night at <laughs> Susie's house tonight. <laughs> That's called compulsory rule. The compulsory rule of Christ. The early church fathers, they believed that what we call the millennial reign of Christ would come to pass 2,000 years after the resurrection. And if you have checked your sacred ecclesiastical calendar timeline Clarence Larkin chart, <laughs> or your faithful, reliable Schofield, C.I. Schofield Bible, or your Dakes Annotated Bible, you will see that we are in the second millennia. We've actually passed into the third millennia as of the correction in the calendar 2003-2005 into the third millennia from the time of Jesus. We're living in monumental days. So Isaiah 42, 25 verses. <clears throat> Please start. Sister Kitty, lovey dovey. <laughs> Honey bunny. Honey bunny. That's Honey. her ecclesiastical title. Mm -hmm. uh, eight verses, please. Okay. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spreadeth forth the earth and that which, and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and, the spirit, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee, in righteousness, I will uphold. I will hold thy hand. I will keep thee. I will, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out of prisons prisoners, bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. 
So in this chapter, Isaiah extends his prophetic declaration from a focus on Cyrus as a coming deliverer to Judah, the coming Messiah, to the coming Messiah, uh, who will bring redemption to all the earth. Cyrus were, would come. Now, you got to understand where Isaiah is at. Isaiah is speaking during the golden age of the reign of Hezekiah. The Assyrians have been destroyed. Um, there is no threat from Babylon, but yet Isaiah is saying, you guys go ahead and have your little soiree, <laughs> but the Babylonians are coming, and nobody wanted to hear that. But then he goes on to say, but uh, be of good courage, because when the Babylonians take you into captivity and destroy this city and the mm -hmm. temple, there's going to be a deliverer by the name of Cyrus. Now, they, they were not paying attention to him. His book was not on the top 10 bestsellers list mm -hmm. during that time. But a hundred years after that, when all of it came to pass, they were going back to the used bookstores and scrounging around mm -hmm. for Isaiah's prophecies mm -hmm. and hanging on every syllable because it all came to pass. But he's also extending his perspective on, yes, this Cyrus who will come as a national deliverer to, the, to Judah, but it, there's this echo of the Messiah who comes not just to deliver a nation, but to deliver all the earth from the vanity of sin. And, uh, and notice, in, he says, when I put, behold my servant in whom I will uphold, this is Cyrus, initially, by extrapolation, Jesus. See, there's like three different levels of fulfillment of prophecy. He said, mine elect in whom my soul will delight, I will put my spirit upon him. Well, when did that happen? John chapter 1, verse 34. John bear record. I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And it's very interesting because John and Isaiah had a lot in common. Isaiah was a member of Levitical family. He was connected with the royal house of David. He lived in the green zone, you know, where <laughs> where the you know inside the Beltway. He was a Beltway politician, as it were. He had great authority, and it's the same way. John the Baptist, he was not born in some backwater. John the Baptist was a member of an elite family. His father served, did his time as at that time in Jesus' day, the high priests they took turns between different families. Mm -hmm at the top of the heap in Judaism that would serve as the high priest, and his dad was one of them. And so John had a silver spoon in his mouth, just like Isaiah. And so it's interesting, the echo of Isaiah, Isaiah said it, John fulfilled it. Isaiah said, prophesied that God was going to put his spirit upon the Messiah. John the Baptist said, I saw the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And Isaiah looked over the ramparts of heaven and said, boom, shakalaka, <laughs> slam dunk, came to pass. That's my new theological term the these sweet, days. It's like the sweet spot. <laughs> <laughs> there are several characteristics of the nature of Christ mentioned here in this passage that are worth bearing mention of as an example to all of us who follow in his footsteps. Notice he shall not, verse 2, he shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Now listen to this. A bruised reed will he not break, and a smoking flax will he not quench. Mm. Do you ever feel like somebody tells you, you need to go put that fire out? If you're a pastor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so, oh, no. I, I, you know, Where there's smoke, there's fire. But Jesus never felt the need to grab the fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. The man came up and said, Jesus, make my brother do right by me in this court proceeding. He said, who made me? Mm -hmm. a ruler over you. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't feel compelled to solve their problems, to get embroiled in their problems. He said he will not fail or be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles will wait for his law. So here is the living life in the Jesus style. <laughs> Number one, don't be self-promoting. Yeah. I'll never forget Mike Bickle. Mike Bickle before he was Mike Bickle. <laughs> made a statement. I heard it on a cassette tape years ago. He said, I'm not addicted to impact. And he's a man that's impacted the world. Yes, amen. Why? Because like Jesus, he will not cry nor lift up his voice in the street. Doesn't need to be heard. 
I've said it time and again. I've said it on this broadcast. My daddy made a statement. He said, the preacher's got something to say about everything. Uh, it's like my, I heard somebody say, preachers are like civil servants. Uh, they think they know a little bit of everything about everything. Mm. And uh, I don't have preacher's itch. I don't have a need. I've got mm. a fire in my belly. I've got a fire in my bones, and there are those times I can't be quiet, but it's not because I need to be heard. And whenever you reach that level of maturity, and I don't know if it's got so much to do with my age or something that Christ has wrought in me, but I just know that I don't need to be heard. I can sit in a room full of people mm -hmm. expressing their opinion and not have a need because I have learned that wisdom, Solomon said, in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Draw it out. You have no authority until somebody draws you out. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually, whenever you see Russ Walden speaking up in a situation, it's usually because I've been asked a question. Exactly right. And uh, never answer a question you have not first been asked. Because <laughs> you have no authority. And. So Jesus was not self-promoting. He was not outwardly influenced. Said a bruised reed, he will not break. How many times do you see people talking about a bruised reed? Somebody that's in a, uh, somebody that's at risk. Somebody that is um, uh, looking at someone in a vulnerable state. I, I know somebody right now who looked at someone who was in a vulnerable state, reached out to do something to help them, immediately achieved national fame. And I won't mention their name because they might be listening to the broadcast. But, uh, but then immediately, the whole thing flipped and became a horrible trial. The whole thing was like a booby trap. It completely backfired. Backfired on the person trying to be helped. Backfired on the person trying to be helpful. Uh, but notice the thing with Jesus. A bruised reed, he will not break. He went past the man at the gate beautiful, the one that Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Jesus went past the man at the gate beautiful his entire life. Jesus passed that guy back. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he kept right on walking. He went to the pool of Bethesda, healed one man among thousands and left with a clean conscience. Why? Mm -hmm. Because a bruised reed, he won't break. He was not compelled by somebody's demand. He was compelled to do what he saw the Father do. Amen. Not addicted to impact like Mike Bickle. So what do we do? <laughs> I suggest you do like the woman with the issue of blood. It was her initiative that brought her healing. Jesus said, your faith has done this. There were times Jesus exercised his faith to do something that the father was telling him to do. But then there were times he was dealing with somebody else's faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, he was saying, I had no intention of healing you, but your faith made a demand. Glory to God. You touched the master's garment. Mm -hmm. Virtue. You realize you can pull on God? Mm -hmm. You get preachers, you get around preachers and particularly prophets. They'll say, now don't be pulling on me. No, please. Well, Jesus never said that. Mm -hmm. If Jesus said that, the woman with the issue of blood would have never been healed. Go ahead and pull on me. Mm -hmm. Because you're not pulling on me, you're pulling on the anointing. Amen. <laughs> mm -hmm. He was not easily, a bruised reed he will not break, smoking flax he will not quench. You get a phone call, there's a family feud brewing. Your sister-in-law is mad at your mama. And your mama is mad at somebody else. Dad's demanding you to go in there and say, oh, no, I don't have a need to put that out. Let it burn. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus didn't feel like he had to solve people's problems on their terms. That's right. Because what he was addicted to was, I only do what I see the Father do. Amen. He was not easily discouraged. He will not fail. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I, you, would you like some failure? Like they're giving you a piece of pie mm -hmm. at the restaurant. No, thank you. No, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need a slice of that failure. Mm -hmm. It's a choice that you make, people. Mm -hmm. Some people teach that failure is how God refines your character. Scripture, please. Show me in the Bible. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, if we're going to, how is it you, you, in your failure, the character of Christ is worked in you when Jesus, it was said of him that he will not fail. Come on now. Oh, you <laughs> high-minded thing, you. Thank you. It's not my mind. It's the mind of Christ, yeah. seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principalities and, and powers. Amen. He will not fail. How do, we, how do we get to the place where we don't fail? Walking in love. Mm -hmm. Love mm -hmm. never fails. A step out of love is a step into failure. That's it. So uh, I would prefer not to fail. Therefore, I'm going to continue in the love of God. Amen. Because the love of God makes my faith detonate. Mm -hmm. You can have faith to move mountains, but outside the love of God, it's like a, a, a brick of C4 without a uh, blasting cap. You can beat it with a hammer. You can do all that. Nothing's going to happen. But you put, mix the love of God in there. The love of God causes the faith you already have to move mountains detonate. And so if your mountains are not being moved, I think the first thing I do is check up on your love, your love situation. <laughs> and he's not easily discouraged. I love what George Patton said, when in doubt, attack. Don't ever turn your back on the enemy. That's right. <laughs> Charge. Why? Because when you see the enemies coming against you, you should also smell those fresh baked biscuits on the table that the Lord has prepared for you in the midst mm -hmm. of your enemies. When they've got you surrounded, oh, Jesus. And he shows up. He says, I'm hungry. Are you hungry? Let's have something to eat. Mm -hmm. And then the enemy is just like flicking flies. Just get the fly swatter out and swat him down mm -hmm. because we're going to enjoy a feast that the Lord has prepared for us in the t as a table in the midst of our enemies. That's right. So in Jesus' lifetime, there were those who accused him of making himself something he wasn't. But Jesus said, I only do, John five nineteen what I see the Father do. His own disciples at times were concerned about Jesus' seeming lack of deference toward those that did not agree with Jesus, toward those that were provoked by things Jesus did. Master, knowest thou not that you offended them? Well, actually, he didn't notice because he wasn't paying attention to what people thought. And he actually told Peter one time, Peter was trying to manipulate him, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you savor not the things that be of God, mm -hmm. but the things that be of man, Matthew 16, 33. That's right. Neither was Jesus despondent or discouraged if others rejected him or disparaged his testimony. He simply maintained faithfulness to the things that the Father commanded him to do. Maintaining his peace and his composure no matter what was going on around him. Uh, verse 9 through 17, please. Okay. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. There's the prophetic. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the ends of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea, and all that therein, the isles, and the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. As in Hawaii, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. Oh, no. <laughs> he shall stir up uh, jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I make waste mountains and hills I, and dry up all their herbs. And I will make the rivers, islands, and I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. And I will make darkness light before them and the crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, you are our gods. Hear ye deaf and look ye blind that you may see. So in other words, there's going to come a day that the Lord's going to look down and say, that'll be enough of that. Mm -hmm. 
we were doing War Room before there was a War Room movie and mostly praying in tongues. We're going to get back to that one of these days. And we were praying in tongues and somebody in Italy, and hello to our Italian listeners. Hello to Linda. Appreciate your partnership with us. And somebody in Italy emailed us and said, while you were praying in tongues, you were saying in perfect Italian, that will be enough of that. (laughs) And so this is something God does in his linear purpose through time, but it's also something he does in your situation. All that garbage you're putting up with, things you're going through, and you're saying, how long, O Lord? There just comes that time when God says, that'll be enough of that. Well, when is that? Well, when have you, when are you, have you had enough? (laughs) Are you just whining and crying and complaining? Or are you rising up in who God is on the inside of you and say, that'll be enough of that? And the Lord said, I was waiting on you to say that. Let's clean this mess up. Amen. (laughs) In Isaiah 11, Isaiah cries by the spirit of the Lord for the cities in the wilderness to lift up their voices and give glory to the Lord. The Lord says that he will go forth as a mighty man with the roar of a lion to prevail against his enemies. In the beginning, Jesus came as a lamb to be a suffering savior. The Jews of the first century could not accept a meek and mild savior. Therefore, they colluded in the crucifixion of their Messiah. In the second coming, Jesus is not coming as a suffering savior, but as a reigning king, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. In verse 14, the Lord speaks. He said, I've held my peace long enough for many centuries, but there's going to come a time he's going to step into the narrative of human history and he will compel the earth and all of its inhabitants to yield to his rule. Paul was quoting the prophet Isaiah when he said, it is written, Romans 14, 11, as I live, saith the Lord. In other words, it's God saying, if there's any life in me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. See, that's his nature. God's got that A-type personality that honestly is not my favorite kind of personality because I'm not that kind of guy. He's one of those guys that when God comes into the room, he becomes the center of attention. That's who he is. That's his nature. And it's how he works in every circumstance, in every situation. Like I've said, and I get lots of emails, (laughs) "Your, your father has this problem. He thinks he's God. You'd be amazed, the emails I get, where we put out the daily word. The Father says today, and people email me, said, who is this Father? That you talk about. Is that Jesus? Do you do you believe in Jesus? <laughs> I thought to myself, these people are so re- far removed from the presence of God and the understanding of who God is, that Father is an alien concept to them. Come on now. Regardless of the tyranny of individualism that we see today, false tolerance that says each his own, everybody just does their own thing, there will come a day in the earth. See, live and let live is not a godly precept. There's going to come a day in the earth that the Lord himself will compel the nations of the earth and the peoples of the earth. He will compel them to yield to his command. During this time, referred to as the millennial reign of Christ, Zechariah 14, 17 says, if the nations refuse to come and worship, he said there will be no reign upon that nation till they defer to the command of God and come to appear before him in Jerusalem. Come on now. Is that literal? You better believe it is. Come on. We must always remember that becoming born again is not just accepting him as Savior, but accepting him as Lord of your life. This means that his word and his leading influence in every single decision you make represents the trajectory of your life over time, reflecting an expression of total and complete deference to Jesus sitting enthroned upon your heart. Mm -hmm. Verse 18 through the end of the chapter. Oh, I did 18. I'm going to do it again. Verse 18. Double (laughs) dipping. Hear ye deaf. And look ye blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf is my messenger that I sent. Who is blind as he that is perfect? And blind is the Lord's servant. Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses they are 
for a prey, and none delivereth, for a spoil, and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned, for they would uh, not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger, and the strength of battle, and it hath set him on fire round about. Yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. So verses 18 through 24 speak of the people of Judah as a servant who chooses not to see, are you blind, mm -hmm. what his master calls for, or not to hear the instructions of his Lord. They see many things, but they choose not to see the simplicity of a call for obedience and yieldedness to God. Because of this, the people are robbed and imprisoned. Yet the prophet is amazed is that even when suffering the consequences of disobedience, none of the people are crying restore. They're not crying out for God to deliver them or restore them. Because of this, when they were ordained to walk in God's favor and receive deliverance from his hand, even so, they become the object of his fury. Yet even in the fires of affliction, it says you're being burned and you don't even take it to heart that it could be different. And unfortunately, what, what leaders and teachers do, they'll take those people that are being burned in the fires of affliction because of disobedience. And he's pat, they're patting them on the hand and saying, it's okay, you're suffering for Jesus when nothing else mm. could be further from the truth. My goodness. Many read a passage like this and they conclude, well, that's just Old Testament and it doesn't apply to us. <laughs> What's the answer? Only in Christ does it not apply to you. Martin Luther, he said, those that are outside of Christ, give them the law. Those that are in Christ, give them grace. God's anger did not e cease to exist just because Jesus went to the cross. Just because we're in a New Testament dispensation. It is true that God poured upon Jesus the full fury of his wrath. But outside of Christ, we only encounter the demands of the law of sin. That's the plain lesson of the Roman road. Paul said, if you're going to walk according to the law, if you're going to reject Christ, you are bound to keep every jot and tittle of the law. It becomes your taskmaster. But in Christ, we experience grace. The people of Judah, they were born into the covenant of God with Abraham. But because of idolatry and generational sin, they suffered greatly and unnecessarily. All that was needful was to forsake their idols, their external dependencies, mm -hmm. and return to God. Yet even in deep suffering, they refused to yield to God. That's the nature of fallen man. Now, what about our own lives? If we choose to go our own way, even as believers, there are consequences that we will not escape. Peter spoke plainly of the fate of born-again believers who lapse in their commitment to Christ. 2 Peter 2.20 For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they become entangled again therein and overcome, Notice they've said, and overcome. Oh, I couldn't help it. I was just overcome. Well, there's still consequences. Yeah. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. In other words, it'd be better off if they'd never known the Lord than to have come to know him and to know him and be lapsed in your obedience and your walk with him. It had been better for them, verse 21, not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment, hello, lordship. Oh, I, I wasn't turning from the Lord. He's my savior. No, okay, we accept him as savior, but what's your disposition toward him as Lord? There's a lot of people that embrace him as savior that do not connect with him as Lord. See, it's talking about people embrace him as savior, but he talks about turning away from the holy commandment. That's his lordship. There are many people that want to embrace Jesus, but they reject the dimension of lordship. Follow me and I will make you. Ain't nobody going to make me do anything. That word means to spend. Follow me and I will spend you like a $10 bill. Ain't nobody going to take advantage of me. Nobody's going to spend me. Don't you know how wonderful I am? How dare you take advantage of me? See? 
than to have known the way of righteousness and then to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. There's much teaching today that says all men are recipients of the mercy of God whether they repent or accept Jesus or not. That is an absolute lie. The argument is that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world and they are forgiven even if they refuse to accept him as Savior. That is not true. This is not reflected in the plain language of Scripture in both the Old and New Testament. Jesus taught plainly in Matthew 25, 41, that even those who claim to serve him, if they are not truly yielded, are in danger of being cast into everlasting fire. We should probably read that verse. Now, I suggest you go read it in context because we're not going to get into the context of it for the sake of time. He says, Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these are people, these are not people that are pagan. These are people that believed they were moving in the gifts, walking under an anointing, doing what they felt like God wanted them to do. But because of a disconnect in their lives regarding his lordship, they're being consigned to everlasting fire. And you get a lot of teaching on that. They'll say a good God would never send anybody to hell. That may be a teaching that appeals to us. But the unfortunate truth is it conflicts with the very words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then people get into that, where they start disparaging the scripture. Well, you know, that was just the culture that they were in when these documents were crafted, and that's how they thought, but that's not how God is today. Boy, we better be careful. We better be careful. But even those that claim to serve him, if they are not yielded to him, there's danger there, just like Peter said. What do you do with that? If we who have experienced the new birth are in jeopardy, if we walk away and choose disobedience, what makes us think that God will wink at the sins of the world as though it is a small thing to reject Jesus as Lord and Savior? Toward that end, we must examine ourselves. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he said, examine yourselves if you be in the faith. Why? If it doesn't matter. If God just gives us the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and from that point he just winks at us every time we make a choice contrary to his character, he just glosses it over. It's okay. It's all good, Mama Bug. It's okay. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't matter. So, well, of course it matters. Well, if everybody's going to heaven and there is no hell and there is no punishment, then, then why, why? Then Christ, we don't need a Savior. See, we, we have to begin to reform our thinking and we have to identify these dangerous doctrines that are not the plain testimony of Scripture. And it's uncomfortable. It's not my favorite thing to talk about. Right. But that's the beauty and that's the astringent value, the cleansing value of going through the Scripture chapter by chapter and deciding whether or not we're going to keep these passages in our canon or will we just redact them and have a Bible with much fewer pages at the end of this project of studying through the Bible than we started at the beginning. Yeah. Great teaching today. Father, we thank you for your word today. And Isaiah, once again, thank you that you're a God to be believed. You're a God to be trusted. You're a God that never fails and your love never fails to draw us closer. Your word never fails to draw us closer into you, that we could be like you, that we could grow up to that full stature of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. We want to be so lit up on the inside that people will inquire of the hope that's within us, and they come asking the question. We've just been itching to tell them about the Savior that is so precious in this world and how they can have deliverance and be set free. Help us to stay lit, fully on fire for you. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.